I'm Ian Hoskins. I'm the author of Rivers, uh, Lifeblood of Australia. I spent the best part of a year driving around Australia researching nine rivers and a river system, the Channel Country of Queensland, trying to understand a little bit more about what um, Australians think about their rivers uh, and the significance of rivers for Australians. I learnt a lot. Um, much of it was um, a little concerning in, in the current environment of climate change, but much of it was very joyous and it was such a pleasure and an honour to be asked to do, do that by the National Library of Australia. I hope you get a chance to read the book and I hope you enjoy it. Hello everyone, I'm Catherine Crane, an editor here at the National Library of Australia in Canberra. Welcome, wherever you are, to this digital only event. Events like this one give us a chance to connect with people around the country, but it's also important to connect with the people and places where we find ourselves. I acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional owners and custodians of this land. I offer my respect to their elders, past and present, and through them to all Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'm here with Ian Hoskins, award-winning writer and passionate historian. Ian is the author of a brand new National Library of Australia book, Rivers, the lifeblood of Australia. In a broad ranging survey of 10 Australian water and river systems, drawing on the library's rich collections, Ian has presented a vibrant and captivating history of our complex connections to water. Welcome Ian, and it's lovely to finally meet you in person. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks for now, your help with the book. Oh, <laughs> um, my honour. Even if I do say so myself, Rivers is an absolutely lovely book. It's full of beautiful pictures, of course, but I found the river histories fascinating, which is not something I confess I ever thought that I would say. And the chapters about the rivers that I'm particularly familiar with, the Molonglo here in Canberra, the Murray, the Franklin, were particularly evocative and just had me remembering all of those times that I've been on those rivers. And you've written another book called Coast, which maps the coastal history of New South Wales. Between the maritime and the riverine histories, what part do water and waterways play in our national culture, our history, our everyday lives? What's the big picture big about picture. water in Australia? Well, um, coastal waters, so the sea, has played a much larger role in our sense of self as Australians, particularly white Australians, because that's where the, the modern Australian beach culture developed. And that was a 20th century phenomenon. So that's what I, that was one of the wonderful revelations of, of the Coast book, is how recent that um, beach culture was. Before that, we were kind of a maritime nation, but eyes were turned inland, you know, to the flocks of sheep or, or whatever. Um, so 20th century, it's looking to beaches and surf and, and all the rest. We know that story. The, the river side of things is clearly there in the historical record, whether it be diaries or, um, or old histories, maps, uh, and the plethora of drawings and paintings that are in the collection. It made the, the um, putting this book together and choosing from your collection was an absolute delight. So it's, it's all there. One of the revelations of writing the river book then was thinking, well, rivers were clearly an important part of um, colonial life and, and 20th century life for that matter, but it all gets subsumed in this notion of the bush. So you've got the bush versus the beach. That's, yes. that's a dichotomy. I mean, bush versus the city is another dichotomy, but we're talking about water. <laughs> so, so bush and beach, but within the bush, there are a plethora of rivers. And when you start looking at the poems that many of us know so well, mm. um, and the songs and the ballads and whatever, so many of them have rivers in them. The Baku, the Lachlan, um, yeah, it goes on and on and on. Let's say the Murray, interestingly. Okay. Um, but the, the Lachlan cert certainly features large and the Baku and, and the Palmer, there was a um, gold rush on the Palmer River in mm. far north Queensland and poems are written about that. So they're there. But because we refer to it as the bush, you tend to forget that there's that river there's life water. there too. There's yes. water, fresh water. Um, and without that fresh water, the bush doesn't exist as a place to inhabit. Mm. So that's, that's Where it one all comes significance. From. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Wonderful. Well, now you 
mentioned our wonderful connections, uh, collections here at the National Library. How did you find that experience of diving into everything? I mean, as a library, it's expected that we have books here, but there are maps, photographs, pictures, paintings, sketches, first-hand accounts in diaries. What was that like for you, just getting into all of that and figuring out what you needed for your research? I'd come to the National Library before. Yes. I'm based in Sydney. Um, but I was primed because of um, the amount of time I'd spent in the State Library, I mean, of the Mitchell course. Library in particular, yes. which, which has a comparable collection. Um, yes, lots of books, but so many manuscripts, mm. unpublished journals and diaries and maps and paintings and drawings and all the rest. So I, I knew, of course, that's what you had. And, and therefore, it was an absolute pleasure, but a, a, a welcome pleasure, Wonderful. an expected pleasure. That's one highlight, like yes, and one highlight while we're on the, on the subject of, um, of collections, was asking for the transparency of Peter Dombrovskis' uh, Rock Island Bend, oh, that yes. photograph, the iconic photograph of the Franklin River. Mm. I went to all the other waterways that I uh, wrote about in this book, but I didn't have the time or the opportunity to get to the Franklin. Mm. I begin all the chapters with an account of looking at the river I'm about to write about, um, but I couldn't with the Franklin. But the substitute, and it was a very good substitute, as, yes. as it turns out, because of the theme I chose with the Franklin, was to look at this transparency, um, which was the original artefact, the original image, because he didn't produce a negative, and he never, to my knowledge, produced a print from this transparency, so this was it. This the is the tiny close, little. It, yes, one. it was a medium format okay. transparency. So, um, just to put that in perspective, most of the negatives people would have seen from old cameras would be 35 mm. mil. Yes. This one was slightly larger, so I didn't have to squint too much when <laughs> I looked at it. But it came up, and I saw it through a light box, and it just glowed like a gem, and oh, it was magical. beautiful. It was magical, and I'd seen the photograph in so many. Um, other uh, manifestations, whether they be the posters or the mm. prints or calendars, it's turned up again and again. Yes. But here was the original thing. He, his is, this is what Peter held yes. as a photographer. So that was very special. I, I mm. can imagine we had a, an exhibition a couple of years ago now with uh, several, well, several, I say several, I think there must have been dozens of his um, transparencies actually blown up into full size prints in our exhibition gallery upstairs. Uh, and at sort of full size, full they're size, just yeah. incredible. Uh, that, that, it's exactly at that moment mm. that I came down to look at his transparency. So I, uh, I then got to see all those prints all those, on the wall. So that uh, was that was good timing. It was a gorgeous mm. exhibition. And uh, as someone with family in Tasmania, that just takes me home. Good. Now this, as we mentioned, was a book that was commissioned by the National Library's publishing imprint, NLA Publishing. What was your reaction when you were invited to write this story? I think I typed yes very quickly <laughs> <laughs> and pushed send and that was a no-brainer. Um, it was an interesting day that one. I, I can't re recall the sequence but that same day I had accepted um, my pitch to another publisher for uh, the book that I've only just finished, which is A History of Australia in the Pacific, oh, which was a huge so topic. And yes. I'd allowed myself quite a lot of time to write that. And then I got the, the email from the National mm. Library saying, would you like to do this? And you've got a year to do it. You've got now. <laughs> yeah, do, we need pretty quickly. Um, and I thought, oh, how am I going to do two of them? Oh, well, that's a problem to be solved. That's a, a bridge to, to be crossed, if, you, yeah, if you'll excuse the, the watery metaphor. Yes. Um, and it's happened, it's happened. Just yesterday, I pushed send on um, the first draft of that Pacific book. So oh, I've managed to do two of them. Yeah. But this was the first off the rate because it, yes, it was well, the more urgent. We needed it, you we did, needed it yes. more quickly. And did you find uh, the experience of writing this one where it had been commissioned, uh, so to speak, uh, different to writing or researching something that came out of your own research interests? It was. Um, yes, it was different. That's a good question. Uh, and I think in some ways it was easier because the parameters had been set by someone else. Ah. This is the word length, which I exceeded. 
Um, <laughs> you wouldn't be the first. <laughs> but thanks for accepting the, the, the extra words. Uh, so there's the word length and there's the time frame. Mm -hmm. And you have X number of images to use and they'll be from our collection. Well, that was wonderful just to have one collection to mine. And you're not thinking, well, should I be looking here, there and everywhere? Uh, so that was all really helpful. So you, you um, cut your cloth to fit or whatever the, the yes, term is. And you know you've got this amount of time. You, you then literally do a mathematical, well, I did, as someone not terribly good at maths, but you work out how, how long you can spend on each river. Yes. Um, the tricky part was getting to the rivers, knowing that writing about landscape, at least for me, which I've done in the past, is um, enhanced by going to the places you're writing about, seeing them. Of course. And they may have changed, I mean, they will have changed over time. So you may be writing about a landscape that in a sense doesn't exist today, so you're looking mm -hmm. at a different place, but understanding those changes and seeing those um, landscapes nonetheless in their modern incarnation is so helpful. So I couldn't have written it without that, mm. um, but it was pretty pretty interesting sort of leaping in and out of hire cars and racing <laughs> off through Queensland and um, driving from Darwin through Kakadu and then down mm. to the Ord River and back again. Sounds in, like a great trip. It, it was a pretty interesting trip in a, in a camper van that wasn't all that fast. <laughs> <laughs> it was very heavy because it had all the, the camping, mm -hmm. the beds and stuff in the back. So, you know, ploughing along. But, gee, I, I saw parts of the country I never thought I'd actually get to see. Mm -hmm. So that was a privilege. Yeah, oh, that was wonderful. great. Wonderful. Well, something mm -hmm. for us all to follow, perhaps. We can all yes, take use it the as book a as a guidebook. Book. Yeah, a, a bucket list book. Uh, and you, obviously, part of your process was going to see these places, but I think the eternal question that people want to know from authors is, what's your process? So you, you've been and had a look at these. How do you get started beyond that? Do you have a narrative idea from the beginning of how things will progress? Does that evolve and for rivers as well, but generally speaking, do you like to have a set plan or do you just see where things take you? Well, if, if I'm thinking of a book myself, I've, I've been gelling it, you know, turning it over in my mind and I have a sense of that. This came out of the blue, mm -hmm. <laughs> quite literally. Yes. You know, there's the email. Goodness. And I'd not given two thoughts about rivers, to be mm -hmm. honest. I really hadn't. Um, but I had written a lot about landscape, as I've said, so there are certain themes that you know are going to pop up whatever the landscape you're writing about. Yes. Um, the way Europeans change landscape, mm -hmm. the different ways that Europeans use landscape to Aboriginal people are the, the, the obvious ones, but there are many more besides. Um, what was interesting as well was the amount of news that was churning mm -hmm. around as I was writing yes. this, because we were in the middle of droughts and fish kills and driest years. I think last year was the driest year. Um, so that's all, and that, that, that's all there. I have to take into consideration this, mm. um, particularly affected uh, writing on the Murray, because so much of it was to do with the Murray-Darling Authority and that complex river system. And I just wrote about the Murray. I didn't write about all the other rivers in that, in that system. Um, so that was important. But the first decision I, I knew I had to make was what rivers and why National Library of Australia it's got to be um, it's got to be representative of the whole country because that's tick. what you are tick that one yes so a river from every state and territory is important mm -hmm. um, that helps so it's there's more parameter start. yep yes um, and then there's no point in writing the same thing about eight nine ten different rivers mm -hmm. Choose a river that's going to say something particular about our relationship to rivers. And that was interesting. And it was actually not that hard, uh, oh. oddly enough, for, you know, even for someone who'd, as I said, not thought too much about rivers. So, well, I need an urban river. Well, I could have chosen the Swan or mm -hmm. I could have chosen the Torrens. But the Yarra seemed to be the obvious one. Mm. And it's got those beautiful bridges. Yes. I mean, bridges that Incredible. look like yeah, Parisian bridges. That's right. So, and... And I don't recall anyone writing too much about the bridges of the Yarra, so I, well, that's important. And, and everyone knows the Yarra for being, at one point, particularly a, 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 um, a polluted river, you yes. know, the, the river that runs upside down, for heaven's sake. Mm. Well, it was a much more beautiful river than I've been led to believe, particularly as a Sydney cider. 
Um, and so I knew I had to cover that part, but then there's, then there's the beautiful river, which was a, the surprise to me. So the urban river, um, the Ord was the river that had been transformed through heroic oh, engineering. Yes. That was part of the Snowy story, but the Snowy was also a river that had entered our national consciousness because of a poem, mm -hmm. even though the river doesn't appear in the poem, weird. Mm -hmm. The Franklin that I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. was the river that absolutely epitomises European Australians, white Australians, non-Indigenous Australians um, sense of wilderness mm -hmm. with a capital W as an idea yes. and it's very different to how Aboriginal people regard it and that was interesting um, and so it unfolded. Um, I mean I could go through them all but we, we can talk about more um, yeah, as, a, yes. as the conversation unfolds. The stories were there to find. The stories were there to find mm -hmm. having um, settled on the rivers. Yeah. And, and knowing what, what it is I wanted that, why I found that river interesting and mm. um, knowing what its relationship was. Great. And the editorial relationship can be a bit peculiar. Um, we have just met for the first time today in person, <laughs> even though we were working on this book last year in 2019. And so you can spend so many months or even years working with someone and never meet them in person. And yet you have to have a lot of trust in each other, or rather you have to have a lot of trust in your editor that they understand you well enough to do the right thing for you, to let your voice shine. How do you find that part of producing a book when you've um, spent all of this time working on it, you've put your heart and soul into it and you pass on a manuscript and someone like me comes along and says, oh, I think we should just move this here and I think we should cut this out and you could write some more about this. What's that part of it like? Well, <laughs> let, let's be honest. <laughs> Look, We're I'm, all friends here. Um, and all of that is in the past and someone enough, else did that part with oddly you. Oddly enough, the first big book that I wrote, it was A History of Sydney Harbour, and I sent it off and it was my first book. I mean, I've written many things before, but this was like first big serious book, 110,000 words. It's a big book. It is a big book. And I didn't really have an idea how to write a book. Mm -hmm. And it came back and the editor said, this is a clean manuscript. There's not much to do here. And I thought, oh, oh congratulations. How about that? Now, I'm sure, she, I'm sure there could have been more. Um, and there were, some, there were plenty of typos and, and one and, a few grammatical errors, I'm sure. So that was an interesting experience. A little bit more intervention with the Coast book, but not too much more. With the National Library, you did a really close edit and, <laughs> and, and you did something more than the, uh, uh, is it a structural edit that? A structural edit would be our first stage where we look at the manuscript as a whole and yes. we say, how's this working? when we read it from beginning to end, yeah. we're not worrying about the typos yet. And, I, and I, th I think it passed muster there and there were typos to fix. But what you did that I had never um, had the luxury of, of before is a really close fact check as well. Oh, we and, have to and, get things right as a library. Well, absolutely you do. And thank heavens you did because there are so many facts and figures swirling around in this book mm. and I'm a historian I'm not a hydrographer or a biologist and an ecologist and there are so many scientific ex um, well there's so much scientific information that goes into writing a book mm. like this that y you run it past a, a river expert and they're going to say this is not quite right and mm. you can't really say that about that and whatever and you could go on forever but you picked up some important errors that would have been terribly embarrassing for all of us. So I'm very appreciative of that. That was a very close read. For. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I'm glad that it was not too painful for no, you then. No, <laughs> no, I, no one wants to be embarrassed. No, yeah. indeed. Um, and so in your own writing process when you were drafting or in that editing stage, um, what was the most significant thing or something you were very attached to that you had to edit out of the book. What did you leave behind? Is there a story you would have been fascinated by that you wanted to share but just didn't really fit? You know, I don't think there was because Wonderful. because you were so generous with with your word allowance. I mean, the first word allowance was was not very generous <laughs> at all, <laughs> um, and I couldn't really see how I was going to write a book about 
10 rivers, which is, again, the, the suggestion came from the library. Please write about 10 rivers. And I said, how about nine in a river system? OK, that's fine. But I, I can't remember what that first allowance was. But it was really just a, a few thousand words on each river, which was terribly hard. And I thought, well, I'll mm -hmm. give it a go. Um, but it proved impossible. And I, again, I can't quite remember the, the word length for each chapter, but it was a little more than that. And when you add it up with mm -hmm. 10, it was considerably it more than the... goes over yeah, very but quickly. You, but you, you allowed me to do that, and, and thank you for that. Oh, well, <laughs> and I think hopefully not me the result personally. Is, yeah, well, well, someone did. Someone, someone was, did. was nice oh, yes. and generous. Um, and I think it worked, you know, so that yeah. was good. Yeah. Well, and it's certainly a nice size in the it's end not too as big. well. And it's I think not there's too a big. good balance of mm. images and text as you go through. Mm. Uh, it's nice and easy to read. I've got to say that... It, it took a little while to see the, the, the physical book yes. and I'd, um, I'd received PDF copies mm. and PDF copies of the, the, the completed manuscript. Um, and I had in mind something that was going to be in landscape format ah. and was going to be quite shiny and, and I, I even wondered whether it might be a bit too shiny. Too shiny. <laughs> <laughs> Things are deceptive too, on a screen, well, aren't they? Yes, they are. They, they're very shiny yes. on screen. Um, and it might look a bit too much like a travel book. And then when the, mm. the first copy turned up on my desk in a padded bag, I thought this looks beautiful, you know, that's great. It does, yes, yes. it does. And We're it's a very nice size, pleased with it. very square, unusually yes. square, but uh, very tactile. Yes, that's a good, it's a good mm. feeling book mm. in the hand. Um, now on to less superficial matters as what a book feels like in the hand, which is very important to book readers. You want um, something to feel nice. So we touched on the uh, Murray River and the Darling earlier. And in the afterword to the book, you mentioned the catastrophic fish kill at Menindi at the beginning of 2019. And as you said, we went on to have Australia's warmest and driest year uh, on record. And then that culminated in um, the horrific bushfire season over the mm. summer and we've been fortunate to have a little bit more rain this year and we're forecast to have a La Nina system come through which usually does bring more rain. In terms of both the short and the long term, what's your feeling about this as a non-scientist? Mm. Um, do you have a feeling about whether this would be enough to save the rivers, the, particularly the ones that you mentioned as at risk of drying yeah. up? Here's what I learned um, that I hadn't fully appreciated, that Australia's rivers are a bit different to mm -hmm. European rivers and North American rivers. Mm -hmm. I can't talk enough about Asian rivers, but I suspect they're quite different to those as well, um, in that they flow sometimes and not at others. Um, and if the flow doesn't entirely stop, it significantly reduces. One of the first things I did upon starting, apart from choosing my 10 rivers and the themes that would go along with them, was pull down an old atlas that I hadn't long had, but went back in the family some way. Not a very, very old atlas, a, an atlas from the late 60s, um, but it was a historical document nonetheless. There, there were yes. many roads that weren't shown on this atlas that are there today. There were lots of homesteads picked out on these huge folio size um, maps that possibly aren't there today either. So it was a really interesting document. The thing that really leapt out at me was the number of little blue squiggly lines all over the, the, um, the maps, which were creeks and washes and rivers. And I thought, God, the driest inhabited continent on the world, on, the, on Earth, is nonetheless covered with waterways of one sort. And I looked over at the quay and, well, some of them are perennial and most of them aren't. You know, they're little dotted oh, lines, so they yes. don't run all the time. In fact, they may hardly ever run. I certainly got an appreciation of that when I was driving through central Queensland, going over one dry wash after another. There's a bridge over nothing, basically. Yeah. It's just a dusty, dusty canal. Um, so for, for a long time, perhaps time immemorial, our rivers have run. We've had um, flooding rains and droughts, just as Dorothy McKellar described in that famous poem. And Aboriginal people adapted to that and I'm sure they were um, so sensitive to the seasons they knew when one was coming in and the other wasn't. Um, but 
Europeans found it hard to adapt because they were building, <laughs> they were building towns beside rivers that would seasonally flood. Gundagai is a good example. It yes. just washed away in the 1850s as if it never existed. Uh, how about that? It only just popped up. Mm. Um, but there's something else that's changing, which, which is obvious, and that's, mm. that, that's the climate. So the dry seasons are getting longer and the rains are getting more extreme. And that's, mm. I mean, for heaven's sake, that's got to change the ecology of the rivers. And the other thing is that the, the, the wets that are coming that may be more extreme, in my understanding, are not making up for the dries. Mm. So that's different. Now, we still have people, politicians, <laughs> Um, saying, well, therefore, that's the better argument for building dams because we've got to trap that water when it's there in these extreme wet weather events for the dry weather events. We've been talking about dams for so long in this country, for nearly 250 years, not 200, 150 years. Um, th clearly, building a dam on a river affects the ecology further down and affects, mm -hmm. in fact, it affects the people further down. So that's not necessarily the answer. The, the answer seems to me in adapting our way of life, not just agriculture, not putting it all just on the farmers, everyone's way of life and our water usage has to, has to change. So, and therefore it's not just about emissions, which is the big picture, and we're still a coal exporting nation, one of the largest coal exporting nations, but it's also about changing our, our water uses and the way we use the land. Um, I don't know how that happens, you know, I, I really, don't. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. And there is that, um, obviously how that happens, there's an expectation that there, that will happen at a national and an international level to reduce those emissions uh, and to change the way that we live. Um, on an individual level that can seem very difficult. Is it just starting to look at the way we individually consume water? in our homes? I'm sure is it, it is, because, because when there have been water restrictions in the past, and, and I recall in Sydney, um, when the levels of the Warragamba Dam went down, what well, was in the last decade, it was probably the millennium um, mm -hmm. drought, so early, early 21st century. People did. They stopped watering their gardens, and usage went right down. I was at the supermarket yesterday evening and I'm still seeing people loading plastic bottles of water into their, to the back of their car, like by the pallet load, as if the water that comes out of the tap is not good enough, um, which I find mind boggling. I'm not quite sure why people do that. The thing is that that water comes out of groundwater, out of springs, and that's taking the water out of the, the ground as well, even though it's not coming out of rivers. So there's a whole lot of water uses that need to change. That would be one, hosing down your footpath, which, <laughs> goodness me, I still see in Sydney quite a lot, is crank another. Crank out the brooms. Crank out the brooms. Um, people do use the, the little trigger hoses when they're doing their, their cars. I hardly ever wash my car. <laughs> but that's more laziness <laughs> than... Just going than, to get dirty again. Yeah, than me being sort of moral and ethical. Um, but I'm sure there are all sorts of ways to do that. <laughs> Taking a bucket into the shower may be one and using that bucket of water to put on the, on the roses instead of mm. coming straight out of the, um, the pipes. That might be another. But I, I honestly don't know what the proportion um, of water saved in those small instances would be, but clearly there has to be a more systematic um, restriction of water or, or different use of water at any rate. Yeah. Mm. So a long-term shift coming I think. One of many, yes. yeah. It seems to be one shift after another. I mean, we've just been through a, a year of a pandemic and people have adapted um, with great hardship, but very quickly. It, it's interesting to think that there was an emergency that suddenly appeared on the doorstep as an absolute emergency. We have to act now, and people did. This other emergency has been called an emergency by many people, not by others for a long time, yet because it unfolds, um, that sense of urgency isn't there. The bushfires that you mentioned were seen to be a wake-up call, but climate change has fallen off the news agenda because of the pandemic. Whether it'll get back up again once the pandemic is sorted, mm -hmm. I don't know. But um, the, the election of a, a new US president may 
cause a shift in Australia. I'm, I'm not sure because he believes in climate change mm -hmm. and, and Trump didn't. And I understand the Japanese Prime Minister feels the same way. And, and Boris Johnson, who's a, a Conservative Prime Minister, talks a lot about climate change and the need to mm -hmm. act upon that. And, and our Conservative side of politics um, does so less willingly, it seems to me. It's be interesting to see whether once this more urgent emergency uh, settles down a bit, whether there will be a little bit more space for another emergency, perhaps we can Well, just if something focus else comes along, yes, who thing. knows what it'll be. I hope not, because the, the emergency of, of climate change and water use needs to be addressed, clearly, yeah. And, and where that tipping point arrives that we've heard so much about, I mean, that really scares me, because a tipping point, is it, it's then beyond our control. Things just unfold. Yes. Um, yeah, all these all these environmental systems start tipping over in some some form or other. So, yeah, you're playing catch up after that. Yes. Uh, well, we might um, move to something a little uh, less grim, if you will permit me, and a little more personal. What place do rivers play in your life? Well, I I was asked that question the other day, and I said, well, I'm not sure whether. I am that attached to rivers. I, I just write about rivers. Um, and and the, the interviewer pulled me up and said, well, surely there was a river that meant something to you as a child. And I thought, well, yes, there was. Yes. Um, I grew up for, I moved around a lot, but for a period um, on inland from Coffs Harbour on a plateau near a little town called Dorigo. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a little river that ran there called the Little Murray for reasons that I've never discovered, and I should really research that, because mm. it's a long way from the Murray. <laughs> <laughs> it has no relationship to the Murray, as far as I can tell. In fact, it would be connected to river systems that flow eastward into the sea, I'm pretty sure. But it was called the Little Murray. And it was a wonderful river, and there was a big granite boulder in the middle of it, which we jumped off and dived off, mm. if you were brave enough, because you're yeah. never quite sure with rivers what lay beneath. Yes and you'd hit a snag or something, goodness mm. me. Th there was some tragedies in the Little Murray that I recall. Um, none affected me, fortunately. But the, the hot summers spent in that river flapping about was mm. so, so much fun. So there's a river yes. and it's interesting. I, I had a swim in the Murray when I was doing my research and driving around here. And I hadn't had to swim in a river for so long because I'm if, either swimming pool or you go mm. to the beach. I'm from Sydney. Um, but it, the, the water just feels so different I mean, because it's fresh water, of course, but particularly if it's muddy and it was, yes. and it was a little turbid in the, in the Murray when I was there. So that's interesting. I, I lived for a long time in a um, suburb called Marrickville in Sydney and the closest river there is the Cooks River, mm -hmm. named after James Cook. Um, and I do mention that at, the, at the, uh, the end of the book because at the time of writing most of that, I, w I was at Marrickville. Um, and that's a river that has been both loved and abused and is a classic river that's been affected by Europeans. The early paintings of that, Conrad Martins painted mm -hmm. uh, a beautiful villa on the banks of that called Tempe House as if it was a, um, an Arcadia. And it was mm -hmm. back in the day in the 1830s. But then very quickly it just became a sewer. And it's still a pretty problematic river. And you mm -hmm. go further up and I did ride many times along the river where there was a bike path, and it goes from being a natural river bank to literally a concrete canal. It's still the Cooks River, yeah. but that's a canal. I mean, it, it's not a, it's not a natural a, water course at all. So river, how about that? Mm, yeah. So we just put our imprint we, on We do, the land, and I we? ended, I tried to end on a, on a positive note. We'll bring it back around we, to We'll bring it back around, but here's a positive note anyway to, to inject into the conversation. All the times I walk beside the Cooks River thinking, God, this is, a, this is a sad looking river. So many of those plastic water bottles, you know, that's yeah. the other bad thing about water bottles is the plastic bottle has to go somewhere once yes. you've drunk the contents. And they'd end up in the mangroves and there they all were amongst the mangroves beside the Cooks River. I gave up trying to fish them out. There were just literally hundreds and hundreds every week. But on other occasions I'd go down and there would be royal spoonbills gleaming white. I don't know how they keep themselves so clean. That's a, a beautiful bird, water bird, with a big spoon-shaped bill and it just sifts around in the water like that, getting the plankton or whatever it is that lives in this mess. 
and they'd be there and I thought, goodness, nature is so resilient. <laughs> Oh, and just? look at those, yeah, look at those. They, they even keep their feathers clean. Oh, it's important <laughs> that as a was bird inspiring. to keep your feathers mm. clean. Oh, I'm glad to hear that there was still a little bit the, the, of, that's, of nature there I used birds enjoy. throughout the book, um, being a bird lover, um, as a grounding moment and often as a way to introduce each chapter. I'd, I'd see which bird I saw first. Oh, yeah. right. I had noticed that there were a few birds, I have to say. Um, now. We've touched on this, of course. It's been a very strange year, to say the least, 2020. And you mentioned you've been working on your history of Australia in the Pacific and that that's just been handed in. Um, when can we look forward to seeing that? When should we keep an eye out? Depends how long the editing pressure is. <laughs> <laughs> how close are you want to edit it? Um, <laughs> that was even longer than this book. Oh, goodness oh. me. I hope they're tolerant. Uh, I really hope next year. Yeah, I mean, that's the plan. Wonderful. So unless something terribly goes wrong. Like um, um, printers being shut due to a pandemic and all of the that. delaying so publication of a book. Give it, a, give it a, the best part mm. of a year. Give it several months for all the things that have to happen. And maybe Christmas next year. Christmas 2021. Oh, yeah, okay. Watch that space. We will watch it indeed. Thank you very much for sitting down with me today. It's been a great conversation. Thank and you, I'm Catherine. keen to go back and, and reread now with uh, somewhat new eyes. It has been a while since I've done a full read. Oh, good. And well, well indeed, with, take, with the pictures. i got my copy and yeah, take I hope it you home. enjoy it. Thank Second you. Second time round. Very much. Thank I will. You. I am, uh, well, fourth or fifth time round, and I'm confident that it'll be just as great as the first. And for those of you who we have intrigued today, Ian's book Rivers is on sale in the National Library Bookshop on site and online uh, and from a selection of very good bookstores. Enjoy the rest of your day.